Our second scripture passage this day is from the 55th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me, and listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander to the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for God has glorified you. Seek the Lord while God may be found, and call upon the Lord while God is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that God may have mercy on them. Return to our God, for the Lord will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent. The word of the Lord. In the passage Joanne read for us, Jesus' followers are wanting him to answer questions we always want God to answer for us to. Why do bad things happen to good people? We recognize that Jesus, the ultimate good people, is on his way to Jerusalem where the bad thing of death on a cross is about to happen to him. Jesus can't be uninterested in this conversation, we presume. But it seems as if Jesus and his disciples are reading the newspaper as they walk to Jerusalem. And as they bring up the stories of the day to ask the questions of their faith, which is what our faith ought to be able to do, we read the news in one hand and the Bible in the other. We see how they connect. We see how they don't connect. We see how they leave us anxious or hopeful or just flummoxed and confused. And apparently some people had died when a tower in Siloam collapsed on them. And we don't know where Siloam is, but the story reminds us of deaths from earthquakes or mass shootings, or when people die too young from cancer, or when Putin invades Ukraine, etc. People who are just going about their lives when it all falls apart. Just this week, a golf team was killed in a car accident in West Texas. It is not hard to find the towers of Siloam in our news and in our world today. The other illustration that Luke gives us is not quite as clear. Some Galileans had been murdered by Pilate, and the description is that their blood was mingled with their sacrifice, which tells us a few things. First, they were in the temple in Jerusalem because that's the only place a good Jew would have been making sacrifices. It's a desolating sacrilege. This illustration may just have been about the first question, why do bad things happen to faithful people doing their good church work? Or it may have been intended to stir up Jesus' nationalistic fervor. Or it may just remind us that being faithful is no guarantee of a long, painful, easy life. In any case, Jesus is on his way to his own cross event, and he has been calling people to repent and to prepare for the transformation of the world that was about to take place. And even though he knows where he's going, he stops here, and he pauses to take the time to address the misconceptions behind their questions. Because the common assumption of people then, and maybe a little bit now if we're honest with ourselves, is that when bad things happen to people, they must have somehow done something to deserve it that God is punishing them for their own sins or the sins of their ancestors. 
And Jesus stops them in their tracks. Do you think that because these people suffered in this way that they're worse sinners than the other Galileans? You know, when he puts it that way, it doesn't sound quite right, does it? Jesus calls us to fight that tendency in our culture to blame a tragedy on its victims. Whether we blame the victims or whether we blame Pilate, whether we blame the engineers who designed the Tower of Siloam or terrorists, whether we blame Hollywood or video games or the person in the White House, we want to blame things on people, don't we? And Jesus won't let us. Because good people die in bad accidents and from cancer, and bad people live to be 100 and die in their sleep. Bad people die in accidents, too, for that matter. And good people live to be 100 and die in their sleep. In truth, our good and bad dichotomy is false from the very beginning. The best of us are not entirely perfect, and the worst of us are not beyond God's redeeming. So blaming others doesn't change the fact that life is fragile and beautiful and uncertain, Blaming others doesn't change the issue that is actually within our control. Repentance. Repentance isn't a word Presbyterians like to talk about, so just bear with me. Jesus says, do you really think these people are worse sinners than any of the rest of you? Whether you die when a tower collapses or die quietly in your bed, don't ask the wrong questions. Yes, life is fragile and short, he says, so don't worry about the righteousness of your neighbor. Worry about your own life. That ought to keep you plenty busy, right? And then Jesus talks about a fig tree. The fig tree has been in the landowner's vineyard for three years, and it's not fruit. Cut it down, he says, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do if you believe that things are only of value for what they produce and how they bear fruit. So that's our question for this third week of Lent. From where does our value come? Is it from our productivity, from our success? The gardener argues with the landowner on behalf of the unproductive fig tree. Just one more year, if I spread some manure around it, I'm sure it's going to produce figs. I don't know that this is actually very good gardening advice. I mean, it might be. But it is a great illustration of the faithfulness of God. Because God, like the faithful, guards us with mercy beyond measure. Long after we should be moved out of the garden, God, for reasons only God can understand, continues to prune us and continues to nurture us and continues to have faith in our potential. When Jesus confronts the people about the Galileans and the Tower of Siloam folks, he talks about a fig tree and he says, what kind of fig tree are you going to be? Not in terms of productivity, but in terms of bearing fruits of love, the way Noor did in Allison's story. We want to ask what's going to keep us safe God wants us to be asking, what can we do to bear fruit with that one beautiful and fragile life we've been given? We ask the wrong questions, and the fig tree reminds us maybe to ask different ones. Because if God were in the business of handing out punishment for the consequence of our behavior, none of us would be standing, and there would not be a single fig tree in anybody's vineyard. So thanks be to God for the unfathomable mercy of God that our little fig trees are still standing and still striving to be faithful disciples and still working to bear fruit in a hurting and hungry world. Isaiah reminds us of God's mysterious mercy too. Seek the Lord while God may be found and call upon the Lord while God is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts and let them return to the Lord that God may have mercy on them. For our God will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God is not a mystery for us to untangle. We are called to seek God in all of God's mysterious ways, and not to seek answers. Our repentance does matter. Repentance, or turning back to God, um, it tends us back to God, to living our lives for God, to standing up for justice, for actively seeking God's kingdom on earth as a response to God's love and mercy. Repentance doesn't mean that we somehow think we're going to stop making mistakes or start being perfect or work our way towards salvation. Repentance is the opposite of that. It's the acknowledgement that we try to do it all on our own and we deny our createdness, our part in God's garden. We pretend that we have it all together. Repentance ultimately is our response to our awareness of grace.
that good things happen to us. When we get hung up on the fact that the truth and the reality that bad things happen to good people, Jesus calls us to remember that good things happen to good people as well. And it is in the good and the bad and the boring equally that we are called to live out our calling and bear fruit. The invitation of God in Isaiah's gospel remains for us. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. We're reminded in scripture again and again that God's economy is different than ours. God wants our flourishing and our health. So what happens to the fig tree after the parable ends? We don't know. Luke does never come back to the fig tree story in his gospel. That means we get to write that story in our own lives. We are the fig trees who have been nurtured by a faithful gardener, and we can still write the ending. So may our faith in God, who fearlessly calls us to love, help us focus our energy toward bearing good fruit of love out in the world. May it be so. Amen.